what's up all my movie loving maniacs now before i show you my october instant review comp i want to make a special announcement in which starting in november i am going to release most of my reviews individually on youtube no more monthly comps all my reviews for newer movies and some older movies and movie related videos and topics i will be posting them individually on my youtube channel and again as far as reviews goes it's going to be mostly for newer movies and some reviews for movies that i'm watching and prep for a new movie that's coming out i'm still deciding on which videos i'm going to release but that is the plan so this october compilation video will be the last one i still might do a couple of compilations here or there for like some series of reviews or whatever but overall all the mother reviews of every reviews and small videos i do there will be no more just individually here on youtube so watch them like them comment share them tell me what you think and i'm doing this just to switch things up a little bit just to test some things out and see where things goes and now with that announcement out of the way here is the last compilation video or at least the one that I will do probably for a good while. Here's my October Insta Reviews compilation. <laughs> the Exorcist Believer is the sixth film in the Exorcist franchise. It is a direct sequel to the very first Exorcist that came out in 1973, making it a legacy sequel in which Ellen Bernstein from the first film, she returns for a brief moment, but more on that in a little bit. But the film focuses on these two families in which the daughters from these two families, they get possessed and they all come together to free these two young ladies. Now, if you've been following my channel, you know I've been watching all of The Exorcist with the exception of the TV show that came out a couple of years ago, but I've watched all the movies and y'all know how I feel about each and every one of them. You see my rating of all of them. And so now it's all come down to this newest film, which is directed by David Gordon Green, who you may know directed the last three Halloween films, Halloween 2018, Halloween Kills, and Halloween Ends. And I guess once he was done with that franchise, he decided, hey, let's, let me see what I can do with this franchise. Now, this movie is not perfect, but I do think it is the best since the original. And honestly, I don't know what the critics are tripping about. I think this was an enjoyable film. But again, I, it's, not, it's not a perfect movie, but... Hey, it could have been worse, looking at you, Exorcist 2. But I guess what I like about this movie is kind of the structure of how this movie is basically two movies. The first half of this movie in which the two girls go missing, so it's basically a child abduction movie. And then the second half, that's when it's basically turns into an Exorcist movie. But I will say the third act, that's when the third act kind of starts dragging a little bit. But the biggest thing that stood out to me about this movie is just it continues the theme of questioning your faith. And they do this through Leslie Odom Jr.'s character, who is the lead in this film. He does not believe in anything after a tragedy that happened earlier in his life. But the other family, there's really no depth to them. They were just there just for the sake of it. But Leslie Odom Jr., I will say when given the right material, he is a good leading man. And I thought he was a good leading man in here. And he really sold the fact of this thing happening to his daughter. He's just in panic, distress, and frenzy, but really all the parents are in panic, distress, and frenzy after seeing what's happening to the daughters and watching them suffer and thinking that they can't do anything about it. And that's what brings everybody together, no matter what your religion, no matter what your faith is, everybody is coming together for a common goal, which is to stop the suffering of these two young ladies. But in doing that, I will say there are just a bit too many characters that the movie didn't give us enough time with them to really care about them. Now, Ellen Bernstein, she returns from the original film. She's in here for a brief moment. Now, everybody is saying that she really had no purpose in this movie, which I understand where they're coming from. Like, you could really cut her out of this movie and the movie would be no different. But having her in here, I thought it was a nice little nod to the original film and, and tying it to the original film. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with the future of this franchise, given how the movie's box office is turning out so far and how people's perception of this movie, especially on Rotten Tomatoes. But I will say, if anything, David Gordon Green, it was an admirable effort, but he is the wrong person to try to tackle this franchise, or at least try to revive this franchise, because he it worked it worked for him in the Halloween franchise, but Halloween and Exorcist are two completely different things, and I just felt like he just tried to do what he did for Halloween and apply it to here, and that's just not what the Exorcist needs. But really, if we're being real, The Exorcist never really needed any sequels in the first place, but here we are. In the end, like I said, this movie is not perfect, but hey, 
This movie really could have been worse, and I still thought it was an enjoyable film. Just hire someone else to make the next movie, and I think this franchise might be able to pull itself together. But as for The Exorcist Believer, I'm going to give it the thumbs up emoji. <laughs> Totally Killer is a new slasher comedy that was released on Amazon. One of the writers is Sasha Pearl Raver, who you may know from DVD on TV. And of course, I know her from that, but I mostly know her from her work on Screen Junkies. And so when I heard about this movie and found that she was one of the writers, I'm like, I gotta give this movie a watch. But it is about a 16-year-old girl, Jamie, in which her friend creates a time machine in which she's able to go back in time and stop these murders that happened back in 1987, in which these three girls that were murdered are connected to her mother who gets killed in the present day and so Jamie she goes back in time to stop these murders so that she can go back to the future in which her mother is still alive. Now I felt that this was a nice little take on the slasher genre by making it a time travel movie and it was also a great take on time travel because it's basically back to the future but with a slasher element. Now the daughter is played by Kirna Shipka, forgive me if I butcher her name, but she definitely carries this film because She's basically a Gen Zer, in which she goes back in time to the 80s and see how things were a lot different back then compared to how they are now. And you just see her react to the things that happened in the 80s, which I thought was the movie's biggest strength was just the cultural differences between the now generation and the generation from the 80s. And all the 80s references, of course, are there, so that'll make any 80s baby's heart sing. Her mother, Pam, who was played by both Olivia Holt and Julie Bowen, is also the biggest strength of this film because in the future, her mother, she's a completely different person. She's nice. And of course, she has trauma from her friends getting killed. But then when you see her in the 80s, she is probably the one person you would not hang out with as a teenager. She is a mean girl. But Julie connects with her mother via the younger version of herself and realize like, huh, maybe my mom is a lot more cooler than I actually gave her credit for. Really, I'll say some of the gripes I have about this film is the time travel elements of this film. Well, really, you can say that about any time travel movie, but it just feels like with this film, the implications of time travel are just a little scatterbrained and they didn't really go too deep in it, which again, I know this that's not what the film's intention was, but still, they could have put a little bit more emphasis in explaining the time travel aspect of it and just to make it make a little bit more sense because the way things end up in the end, I do have just a couple of questions. Overall, this was an enjoyable film. I highly recommend it. I'm going to give Totally Killer the thumbs up emoji. <laughs> Haunted Mansion is Disney's second attempt at making a movie based on their iconic ride from Disney World and Disneyland after the original film that came out 20 years ago and starred Eddie Murphy in which you got all these different people that enter the titular haunted house and they get haunted and they try to leave but ghosts haunt them wherever they go and so now they have to go back into the house and figure out how to lift whatever is going on with them so that they can go back to living their normal lives again. Now again, y'all know how I feel about the Haunted Mansion movie that came out 20 years ago. You've seen my review of it and I was going to go see this movie when it came out in the theaters but one, I wasn't hearing a lot of things about it, both critically and commercially. I wanted to go see this on $5 Tuesdays over at AMC, but the film's reception, I'll admit, kind of clouded my judgment of the movie. So I said, well, I can go watch this movie that isn't getting a lot of buzz right now, or I can go watch the Barbie movie that everybody's talking about right now. And after watching the Barbie movie, and then after finally watching this, I felt I made the right decision because this movie is definitely a streaming movie, but that does not mean it's bad because I definitely enjoyed the hell out of this movie. It was a lot better than what I thought it was going to be. It's miles better than the Eddie Murphy joint from 2003. It's not scary, but it is scary in just the right ways for kids to enjoy. It's fun, lighthearted horror. I love the New Orleans aspect of it, which definitely lends itself to the horror aspect of the film. I like how they tackle grief in this movie because one of the characters, Keith Lakeith Stanchfield, he lost his wife. And so that is a big part of why he's being haunted. I'd say the first two acts were pretty solid, but the third act, that's when it goes into that typical Hollywood climax. But the characters themselves 
are what sells this film. And honestly, when you look at the cast, this this cast list is stacked, and you're like, well, shit, no wonder this movie bombed. With these big name actors, they're going to demand a lot of money. So of course the budget was big. Now before I get into the cast, I gotta talk about director Justin Simeon, who directed one of my favorite movies from the past decade, Dear White People. But then he also made Bad Hair, which is a movie I felt had pure intentions, but horrible execution. But here I felt Justin Simeon's direction was pretty good. Now granted, he had Disney over him, so of course he had a creative leash on him. But overall, I felt he did the job perfectly. As for the cast, Lakeith Stanchfield, he is definitely the acting standout in this film. In fact, in fact, this is probably some of the best acting I've seen from him, and he was in Judas and the Black Messiah. Because again, he's the one character that is grieving right now. And this movie really shows how he could be leading man material. Rosario Dawson and the young man that play her son, they're great in the film because they're the first ones that actually move into the haunted mansion and have to explain everything to everybody. And so they're just in distress, including the young man that plays the son. Owen Wilson plays a priest. That's just funny in itself. Danny DeVito, I don't know if he was, you know, he was being filmed half the time, but he was great in this film. Tiffany Haddish was surprisingly good in this film. And I really mean that because over the past couple of years, and especially with all her controversies, Tiffany Haddish, she's been kind of annoying as a comedic actress. But here, I felt like she, someone was actually directing her to act and she actually put on a performance. Like there's this one scene in here between her and Lakeith Stanchfield, I felt was very touching and heartfelt. But the two biggest name actors in this film are Jamie Lee Curtis and Jared Leto. Jamie Lee Curtis plays the lady in the crystal ball. And honestly, I felt that role could have been played by anybody. And the fact that Jamie Lee Curtis was in it just kind of took me out of it a little bit. Now granted, I'm a little salty to her right now over her winning Best Supporting Actress over Angela Bassett at the Oscars earlier this year. <laughs> but, hey, it was a thankless role, as well as Jared Leto, who's basically the villain in this movie, and it kind of was a CGI thankless role. Overall, like I said, I think this movie is miles better than the original film. It's an enjoyable film. It's a good movie to watch around this time of the year. This movie definitely should have hit theaters around this time for Halloween instead of doing the summertime. If you have not seen it, I highly recommend it. I'm gonna give Haunted Mansion the thumbs up emoji. <laughs> Saw X was released in theaters almost a month ago, but was released digitally, so I finally got a chance to watch it. And this film also takes place between the first Saw and Saw 2. John Kramer, he is dealing with his cancer diagnosis, but then he comes across someone that tells him about this possible cure. And so he travels to Mexico, they perform a procedure on him, and he's feeling fine, but then he comes to find out that it was all a scam. And that's something that you just don't do to John Kramer. So basically, John Kramer, he was scammed out of his money. And you don't just do that to John Kramer without John Kramer wanting to teach you this valuable lesson. The more you fuck around, the more you're going to find out. And so he gets all the people that scammed him, imprisoned them into this abandoned building, and puts them in traps in which they got to get out. Now, two years ago, I watched every single Saw film for the first time leading up to Spiral. And if you want to know my thoughts on each of them, just scroll through and you will find my reviews of all of them and how I rank and rate all of them. But generally speaking, I like the first two songs. Jigsaw was good. I think Spiral is the freshest thing that's come to this franchise in a long time. But overall, I just feel like Saw is just one of those rare occasions where, hey, you've seen one, you've seen them all. I do admire the fact that it's like 50% torture porn and 50% police procedural. But at the same time, I can only watch torture porn so many times. Now, how did I feel about this 10th film in the franchise? I thought it was actually pretty good and one of the better sequels that we've gotten in a long time from the Saw franchise. Because this film does a good job of making you sympathize with someone that, by all accounts, is just a horrible, despicable person. But in the case of this movie, you do kind of feel from him because, like I said, he got scammed out of his money and it does give a justifiable reason why he wants to torture all these people. Tobin Bell, at this point, he can play this role in his sleep. And bringing him back because the last time he was in a Saw movie was Jigsaw, which came out in 2017. And here he just did not miss a step. We also get the return of Amanda, who is his apprentice. The gripes I do have with this film is that, again, it's still a Saw movie, so which means the traps are going to be a little silly. There are some silly and unpractical elements to this movie. 
I had to refresh my memory on the timeline of these movies, and the timeline, by all accounts, is just scatterbrained as hell. So I know this movie takes place between the second and third film, but I also don't understand how this film affects some of the other films or just how it fits in with the rest of the timeline. But overall, I still enjoyed Saw X. It's, again, one of the better Saw sequels. Tobin Bell did not miss a step at playing Jigsaw slash John Kramer. And the traps are just as nerve-inducing as before. I'm going to give Saw X the thumbs up emoji. <laughs> shirt freddy krueger freddy versus jason is celebrating its 20th anniversary as of summertime I, and i waited till now for halloween to finally give it its due because i love watching this movie every now and then during the halloween season but in which this movie is about freddy resurrecting jason from the dead so that he can terrorize elm street and get people to fear him again and if the, the more people fear him the more stronger freddy krueger becomes again and so that he can terrorize children on elm street but then jason gets out of control and so now freddy and jason fight each other and that's basically the plot of the movie now my history now this was my first exposure to anything related to freddy krueger or jason Voorhees. Hence why this is probably my favorite Freddy and Jason anything because it gave me the right balance of what we know and love from Freddy movies and what we know and love from Jason movies and then it all just it's just a big crossover that comes together just perfectly. Now granted it's cheesy it's not perfect but it's fun and that's exactly what I expect from this movie. Robert England he plays Freddy Krueger and has been playing his character for decades and he shines and relishes the opportunity to share the screen with Jason Voorhees. Even some of the human characters in this movie, such as Monica Keenan, Jason Ritter, and even Kelly Rowland is in this movie. Also, I like their story of how it centers around Freddy and Jason because the town that Elm Street is in, they've all forgotten about Freddy. And so Freddy, he's trying to get them to remember, but the town, they really did a good job of suppressing everybody at Freddy. But then once Freddy and by proxy Jason reemerges, that's when the town is in panic, distress, and frenzy and everybody is coming together to contain this thing like it is a plague. It's not so much negatives I have to say about this movie. I mean, like I said, it's not a perfect movie. I mean, it's definitely not the definitive Freddy or Jason movie, but for me personally, this movie gave me exactly what I wanted from them. And I'm not just saying that for nostalgic purposes, but to me, this is also the perfect crossover movie. It was fun in just the right ways, cheesy in just the right ways, bloody in all the right ways, scary in just the right ways. I'm going to give Freddy vs. Jason the hard eyes emoji. <laughs> Five Nights at Freddy's is the latest video game adaptation. It stars Josh Hutcherson, in which he plays a security guard, and he gets hired to watch over this old, abandoned, Chuck E. Cheese-like pizzeria called Freddy Fazbear's. Basically, he's there to security guard the place until 6 a.m. But while he's there, some weird things start happening, such as child ghosts zessing the old animatronics of the pizzeria. And we have our movie. Now, right off the bat, let me just say I have never played Five Nights at Freddy's. I just, for some reason, it just flew under my radar. I never got a chance to play it or I just never thought about playing it. But, I, but it was always a game that I was always made aware of. I mean, all I really knew about it is that it took place in this pizzeria that's like Chuck E. Cheese. And, and all the animatronics come to life and they scare the shit out of you. And you basically have to survive five nights. And right now, the general consensus of this movie is those who are fans of the games like and appreciate this movie. And those who never played the games think it's one of the worst movies ever made. But where do I fall? Well, I don't think it's the worst movie made this year, but at the same time, but it's also not one of the best movies made this year. I mean, this movie didn't piss me off or make me angry. It's just, it's just okay at best, but it definitely has some glaring issues, though. Now, first off, the cast. Josh Hutcherson, he's fine in the role. Like I said, he plays a security guard. He's the guardian of his sister because his family, they either passed on or left. His younger brother was kidnapped. And so all he has left is his little sister trying to get custody of her from his evil auntie. While he's guarding Freddy's, he also gets help from this other security guard named Vanessa, played by Elizabeth Lyle. And she actually is one of the few people that knows a lot more about Freddy's. 
Matthew Lillard is in this movie, and that's all I'm going to tell you. Just if you want to see where they go with his character, you just gonna have to see for yourself if you're interested in watching this movie. I mean, not to really spoil anything, but now for some of the positives, I will say all this stuff at Freddy's was actually pretty impressive. Like I heard that Jim Henson's workshop had a hand in bringing the animatronics to life, and from what I saw, it was very impressive. I like the atmosphere of it being an abandoned pizzeria with scary animatronics. It, it kind of reminded me of the game, or at least the glimpses of the game that I've seen that reminded me of the game here. And now for the negatives. All the stuff in between, him being at Freddy's, kind of brought the movie down a bit. Because like all the stuff where he's at Freddy's is the more interesting part, but then once he's not there and he gets into his family life and this family drama, it brings the movie down a bit because again he's trying to get custody of his little sister and then it just brings in all this other family drama that nobody's really interested in or asked for i just feel like this movie just would have been just a little bit more interesting had he he had been trapped inside of freddy's for five straight nights he couldn't leave and he's just trapped there and he has to figure out how to get out and when nighttime comes that's when all the scary shit starts happening and i know that's not how the game works but i'm just saying the movie just would have been a lot more interesting that way the movie also would have definitely benefited from an r rating and i understand they wanted this movie to appeal to everybody but at the same time the pg-13 rating i just felt didn't really serve this movie in the end, I did not hate this movie like everybody does, but at the same time, I'm also not over the moon like other like the fans of the game are. I just feel like this movie could have just taken just a little bit more liberties just to make this a more interesting movie. And I understand they have the creator of the original game on this movie so that they can make sure they get this movie right and do the game justice and doesn't piss anybody off, which I understand, but at the same time, as John Campion once said, the goal isn't staying true to the source material. The goal is to make the best movie possible. And if that means taking certain liberties to make the best movie possible, whether you like it or not, it'll still make for a good ass movie and rises above the material, if that makes sense. All that said, I still enjoyed this movie while I was watching it, or maybe I just enjoyed it more because I watched it in the cover of my own home on Peacock because, again, this movie was released day and day, both in theaters and on Peacock. I'm going to give Five Nights at Freddy's the shoulder shrug emoji. Killers of the Flower Moon is the newest film by Martin Scorsese, and it tells a story about these mysterious killings surrounding the Indian Osage tribe in the United States in the 1920s. The FBI is brought in to investigate, and the subject of interest is someone that married into this tribe, as well as his uncle. Now, if you watched my review of Casino, you know how I feel about Martin Scorsese and his takes on the state of modern filmmaking, but I do really admire him as a filmmaker and I respect his impact on cinema. And I've seen a good chunk of his films, but I haven't seen all of his films. His last film was The Irishman back in 2019, which was released on Netflix. And he's a frequent collaborator with such actors such as Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and Leonardo DiCaprio, in which he reunites with both Robert De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio since 30 years ago back in 1993 with their film This Boy's Life. And how did I feel about this film in its three and a half hour runtime? It was actually pretty good. Now granted, I don't think this movie really needed to be three and a half hours long, but while I was watching, I was intrigued and sucked in. Though I could easily find points where like this movie really could have been cut down to maybe two and a half hours, maybe two hours and 40 minutes. But it still flowed seamlessly though. I mean, a lot of people say that this movie was as long as it needed to be and then there's some people like me that just feel like i'm not saying this movie doesn't justify its long run time but at the same time you really could have cut this down a bit and that's really my biggest gripe with this film but other than that this is still a brilliant film because of its subject matter and its performances and the brilliant directing by martin scorsese i mean this film does cover a dark chapter in american history it effectively informs you of this dark chapter and it somewhat draws parallels to today because this film is definitely relevant to today. Because this film is definitely relevant to the social climate of today. As for the cast, Leonardo DiCaprio, this may not be his best performance, but it's still good. Because like I said, he plays Ernest, who marries into this Osage tribe family for personal gain. Robert De Niro, this is probably one of his best performances in years. Martin Scorsese knows how to work with Robert De Niro and make him seem like a charismatic a brutal villain but the heart of this movie definitely goes to lily gladstone who is a member of the osage tribe and her family is wealthy but then she meets leonardo DiCaprio's character they hit it off and 
she's both wise, but at the same time, just oblivious to everything that's really going on. And she is both strong, but sullen, grieving. And at the same time, she's just constantly dying. And once you see what's happening to her, you just feel sorry for her. And you just root for her to like, just get out of there. This is not the man you think he is. And that's also one of the biggest strengths about movies like this that are made by Martin Scorsese is they really question your morality. In the end, I really didn't enjoy this film outside of the runtime. Really, I would give this film the thumbs up emoji, but objectively speaking, this really is a great film. And because of that, I'm gonna give Killers of the Flower Moon the hard eyes emoji. <laughs> <laughs> Living with Chucky is a documentary about the making of Child's Play and its subsequent sequels that followed and the impact it had on pop culture and movies in general. Now for context, I love the Chucky franchise. Chucky, he's one of my favorite horror icons. I own all the movies on Blu-ray. And so when I found out about this documentary, of course I had to watch. I didn't even watch a trailer. I just saw the title and saw what it was about and I'm like, yep, I'm watching this. Now, how did I feel about this documentary? I really dug it, though I will say it was slightly different from what I thought it was going to be. And that's mainly because I went into a code with the title called Living With Chucky. I thought it was really gonna focus on the father-daughter relationship between Brad Dourif, who plays the voice of Chucky, and Fiona Dourif, who is his daughter, and also appeared in the last two Chucky movies. Curse of Chucky and Cult of Chucky. I thought it was gonna focus on their father-daughter relationship and, and what it was like growing up with Brad Dourif and him being the voice of this iconic horror icon and the trail that was left for her to walk. And in a way, it kind of is, but not from their perspective. It was about Kira Gardner, who is the daughter of Tony Gardner, who was one of the puppeteers for Chucky in the original Child Play movies. And it focuses on her, the impact the franchise had on her as a child and what it was like watching her dad work on the movie and how it was hard for him to work on these movies while also trying to be a father. And she also gets interviews from everybody that worked on these movies, from the stars, the voice actors, the producers, the writers, the directors, you name it. This movie is essentially a celebration of the Chucky franchise and the people that made it. And again, they still focus on Brad Dourif and Fiona Dourif, and they focus on on him as an actor before he became Chucky and his contributions to this franchise and then how she got into the franchise. And, and I really mean it because if you've seen Cult of Chucky and Curse of Chucky, you know the character she plays in it and her contributions to the franchise. And she really is truly the seed of Chucky. She's a manifestation of both her father, Brad Dourif, and Chucky. Now, one thing I also didn't know about Chucky is that his, ne his real name, Charles Lee Ray, it's a combination of three famous serial killers, Charles Manson, the person that assassinated JFK, and the person that assassinated Martin Luther King. That was mind-blowing in itself. And like I said, they also focus on other people such as Jennifer Tilly, who plays the voice of Tiffany, the Chucky's bride and Bride of Chucky, even Billy Boyd, who plays Glenn and Glinda, the gender-bending doll from Seed of Chucky. Hey, see the Chucky, say what you will about the movie, it ain't perfect, but it was definitely ahead of its time in terms of LGBTQ representation. You also get interviews from a lot of people, such as Marlon Wayans, Abigail Breslin, Tony Mancini, who is the director of the original Child's Play, even the original kid and his original adopted sister from the first two movies. They get interviewed and they talk about their experiences working on this movie and the impact it had on their lives. I even like some of the transitions they do in this film because the movie starts out with VHS copies of the Charles Play trilogy, Bride of Chucky, Seed of Chucky, and then it switches to DVD with Curse of Chucky and Cold of Chucky. And every time it gets into a new era of this franchise, it, like it puts the VHS tape in and the VHS player and that was very creative to me. Aside from this being a celebration of the Chucky franchise, you also get to see how tight-nipped this family is. Like everybody that worked on this movie, both in front of and behind the camera, they're a very tight-nipped family. And they all check up on each other and visit each other and still see each other from time to time. Now, in conclusion, again, my only gripe about this documentary is I thought it, thought it was really gonna be a case study on Brad and Fiona Dourif, but it turned out to be something else, which I'm totally not mad at. It's just I just feel like it just would have been a more interesting case study if they had just gone that route but regardless i still enjoyed this if you're a fan of the chucky franchise i highly recommend you watch it it's on amazon prime but you still gotta pay or rent it 
but regardless, it's still worth a watch. I'm going to give Living With Chucky the hard eyes emoji. With the new Martin Scorsese film, Killers of the Flower Moon, coming out this weekend, I thought I'd finally watch Casino, which is a movie that I've had on hold for a long time. I'm trying to watch every Martin Scorsese, well not every, but like all the important Martin Scorsese films, and this being one of them. Because I watched Goodfellas for the first time back in 2020, and now here I am watching Casino for the first time. And it's basically a movie ran by Robert De Niro's character in which he runs his casino, but it's also ran by the Mafia. And just like Goodfellas, we get a first row seat into the underground crime world of this casino. Now, I already told you about this is a first time watch for me, but how do I feel about Martin Scorsese as a filmmaker? Despite how I feel about his thoughts about Marvel movies and just the state of film in general right now, and despite the fact that he does have a point about the current state of movies these days, I still think that he is a bit one-sided. And I'll definitely see how he does when I see Killers of the Flower Moon. But as for Casino, I really enjoyed this. However, I do prefer Goodfellas over Casino, but that does not mean I think but that is not a knock at Casino because this is still an excellent film. What I like about both those films is how Martin Scorsese is able to put us, the viewer, into a front row seat of the underground crime world. And that is definitely continued here in Casino. They give you the in and outs. They tell you this person is in charge of this, this person is watching this, this is how this operation is run, and he basically locks it down in a way where, like, you, the viewer, get it. But then it also goes into the personal lives of these characters, and from what I understand, this is somewhat based on a true story. And of course, as for the performances, you got Robert De Niro, he is the head of this casino, and I swear to God, if Robert De Niro did not get lung cancer after watching this movie, because because I swear, there's almost not one scene where he does not have a lit cigarette in his hand. Joe Pesci is basically his usual loud, abrasive, but calm and collective self in this movie, kind of like the character he was in Goodfellas. But what I like about him here is that he's just somewhat just a little bit more tame because this character has somewhat of a chip on his shoulder. He has something to prove. And as far as the De Niro and Pesci pairings in a Martin Scorsese film in which we've had Goodfellas, The Irishman, and Casino, I say here in Casino, this is my favorite of those character pairings. It may because how they start out as friends, but then as the movie goes on, they start being real antagonistic towards each other. There's a power struggle going on, and it ultimately fractures their friendship. Sharon Stone is in this movie, and she plays Robert De Niro's wife in it. She's well deep in the underground crime world, but then we also see how her actions affect him. I say my biggest gripe about this movie is that it does kind of slow down doing the second act, but then it does pick up doing the third act when shit really starts hitting the fan and the feds, they really start picking up on their whole operation. I'm glad I finally sat down and watched this. Now, do not be mad when I give this movie this rating. It's only because of that one gripe I had. And maybe I'll feel differently about this movie going forward, but for right now, I'm going to give Casino the hard eyes emoji. Only Murders in the Building just wrapped up its third season. Charles, Oliver, and Mabel, they come together for another murder that has happened in the building. No pun intended. But anyways, Oliver, he finally puts his play together, in which we saw at the end of season two. He puts his play together, has Paul Rudd in it, and with the addition of Mel Street. But anyways, Paul Rudd, he gets killed, but then turns up alive, but then he gets killed again but this time in the apartment complex that the three of them live in. And so now they're trying to solve it, but at the same time, things start happening in their personal lives for some friction to be caused between the three of them, but then they eventually come back together and they solve the mystery. But I did like the first two seasons, but to me, this third season is the best, in my opinion, thus far. I don't know about season four or whether or not it'll happen, but to me, this is the best season just because of setting it around a Broadway play, the structure of it just works, and the characters are challenged in ways that I don't think the first two seasons did. But of course, Steve Martin and Martin Short, they always bring their comedic A-game to this show. But I will say Steve Martin as Charles, he was a little bit more annoying this time around. But Oliver, you really feel for him because he has a heart attack. He's trying to put this play together in which a murder happened. And then he switches gears by turning his play into a musical. So it's just he has 50 million things going on. But then he starts falling in love with Mel Streep's character, which I'll get into in a little bit. Mabel, played by Selena Gomez, she's dealing with a quarter-life crisis. She's about to turn 30, and she feels like her life has just not been fulfilled 
among turning 30, but then she has a really inspirational speech and conversation with Paul Rudd's character about turning 30. And it just really hit me in the feels because it's like, all right, don't worry. You may be turning 30, but you still have time. Just because your life didn't turn out the way you want it doesn't mean you still have time for you to achieve your goals and dreams. But what you can't do is waste your time. And she even gets a boyfriend this season, played by Jesse Owens. Now, the two newest cast members, Meryl Streep and Paul Rudd. Now, I will say this. I think the Streep meter is about somewhere between an 8.5 and a 9. And what is the Streep meter? Well, everybody talks about how much of a high-class actress Meryl Streep is. And she is on her own right. But anytime I see her anything, I just have this meter on deck so I can see whether or not she goes full Streep or not. And I say the Streep at most went to a 9.5 or a 9 at the lowest. Let's say that. But anyway, she plays an actress. She she gets into Oliver's play, but she has her own hidden agenda, but it's nothing nefarious. But she fits just well into this universe. And then Paul Rudd playing a completely different character than we're used to seeing him. He is a complete dick. He is an actor that's a bit self-centered. He's a bit full of himself. And of course, he's the one that gets killed. Some other guests or reoccurring performances include, like I said, Jesse Owens, who plays Mabel's boyfriend, Tolbert. You also got Ashley Parks, who is one of the actresses in the play, and I just saw her in Joyride, so it's cool to see her in something else. Matthew Broderick has a couple of cameo appearances. Now, this show definitely threw you for a loop a couple of times throughout this season, which I thought was better handled than the first two seasons. And once you see the actual reveal of who the killer is, you're like, oh. If you're aware of Only Murders in the Building but haven't given the show a chance yet, I highly recommend it. And this is the season where I really think this show really finds its stride. And like I said, I think this is the best season thus far. I'm going to give Only Murders in the Building Season 3 the Hard Eyes emoji. Ahsoka is the newest Star Wars show on Disney+, Plus in, in which the show takes place during that time period between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. Ahsoka, she's dealing with Survivor's Guild, but she is also trying to help Sabine find this map that will lead them to finding Ezra, who is a character from Rebels, but also trying to save Ezra without bringing back Thrawn, who is also on this planet where Ezra is. But along their way, the people they have on their back is this witch named Morgan and two former Jedis that have turned to the dark side. Now, of course, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, but as far as all the extended stuff outside of the movies and some of the live action shows, I've never really gotten into the cartoons. Though I did watch the last couple of episodes of Clone Wars, I never really got into Rebels for a couple of reasons. Like, again, I just never got into the show Rebels. And two, I always felt like just have, knowing that there are other Jedi out there other than Luke Skywalker, it just kind of cheapens the fact of Luke being the only remaining Jedi out there. And plus, Star Wars has had a hit or miss track record when it comes to their shows on Disney+. Plus. But Ahsoka is a character that I do admire. And I think she's probably the second best female character in Star Wars, number one being Princess Leia. And I know just enough about her to know how she's one of the best characters from the Clone Wars. But how do I feel about this show overall? Well, the show does have some problems, but I think this is probably one of my favorite Star Wars shows to come out of Disney. Number one being Tales of the Jedi, and I'll put this as a second, maybe third. I still put Mandalorian, but Ahsoka just further affirms what I like about Star Wars and why I think Star Wars is best at, because Star Wars was basically made around the Jedi, and then when you got shows like Mandalorian and Andor, which are good, don't get me wrong, I like that Star Wars is exploring other aspects of the galaxy and other characters outside of Skywalker. But at the same time... It's just, to me, Star Wars is just more fun and interesting when you're dealing with Jedis and lightsabers. And to me, that's where the show excelled. And especially since you're a fan of the prequels, this show was definitely made for you. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Now, Rosario Dawson returns as Ahsoka Tano. And I like Rosario Dawson, but here I just felt like she was just bland and stoic. And I just felt like they didn't really give her enough or she just wasn't given the right direction to play this character. Because like when you watch Ahsoka in the Rebels and the Clone Wars, it feels like she has personality. But here it just feels like she just doesn't. And that's not a knock on Rosario Dawson. But but here it just felt like they just didn't know what to do with this character in terms of showing emotion or or making her an actual character. But regardless, I do like the journey that she goes on because she does have survivor's guilt and she does feel responsible for leaving the Jedi, which caused Anakin to turn to the dark side. And she has immense guilt over that, but then she goes on a journey which she finally lets go of that guilt and then she learns to live, which a lot of people clearly did not get. 
And then you have Sabine Wren, who is lifted from Star Wars Rebels, which is a character that I thought had a lot more emotion than some of the other characters. I feel like she was an actual character, but she does have a bit of a chip on her shoulder, which is an aspect of her character that I did like. And she's just really trying to find Ezra, which is someone that she loved and cared about very much. And I just liked her Jedi and Apprentice dynamic with Ahsoka. Mara is another character lifted from Rebels, but she's hardly a character in this show. But I like the fact that she's played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Ray Stevens, rest in peace, plays one of the Jedi, in fact, the Jedi Master, that helps the Witch Morgan. And he is another character that I thought was the best aspect of the show because he brings some sophistication and elegance to this character. And he's not exactly an evil Jedi. He's just a Jedi that that felt that loves the idea of the Jedi, but not what the Jedi were doing the prequel era and it's sad knowing that he's no longer with us because the character does make it at the end and i don't know what their intentions were for this character going forward but we shall see but they're gonna have to recast him if they plan on doing more with this character grand admiral thrawn has been teased in other star wars shows and now he's finally here and i can't wait to see what they do with him moving forward especially since he's potentially the big bad in this movie that Dave Filoni is putting together that culminates all the Disney Plus shows. And I felt he was, he's also another character that emotionally is a lot different from how they portrayed him in the cartoons because here it just felt like he was just stoic and emotionless. Ezra Miller is the main character that they lifted from Rebels and which this show is centered around in which they finally get to him and lifting him from Rebels to here. I thought they did that excellently. I don't know this actor's name, but I felt he played Ezra perfectly, and I thought his dynamic with both Sabim and Ahsoka was perfect, and I can't wait to see what they do with this character in the future. And then last of the characters that I want to mention is Anakin Skywalker, in which Hayden Christensen reprises the role in the way they used him, especially with Ahsoka. I felt it was excellent and brought their story full circle, even if the de-aging on Hayden Christensen was spotty at times <laughs> now the way the show ended i don't know what they're gonna do with ahsoka moving forward well the character i should say but i just like i said i have a love-hate relationship with stars right now because sometimes they do good things and sometimes they do okay things and sometimes they do things that i'm just not a fan of but in this show i'd say it's definitely up there with my favorite star wars disney plus shows i was thoroughly entertained with this show i couldn't wait to watch a new episode every week probably the most fun i've had with star wars in a long time i'm gonna give ahsoka the thumbs up emoji the Continental is a mini-series spinoff of the John Wick franchise in which it takes place in the 70s. And we follow Winston, who was the head of the Continental in the John Wick movies. But this takes place in an earlier time before he's the head of the Continental, in which the show is basically him trying to take the Continental from Mel Gibson's character. And then we also get some backstory on him and his brother. Now, as for the John Wick franchise, again, if you saw my reviews of all four movies, you know how I feel about them. The first one's the best. The fourth one, I think, is the best of the sequels. And the other two are... Mm. And now they're trying to expand the John Wick franchise outside of the John Wick character by focusing on other characters in the universe and other aspects. Like, I know there's a movie called The Ballerina that's supposed to star Ana de Armos, but this right here is the first one. And I say it definitely keeps in spirit of John Wick with the action, the vibe. The show is basically an extension of the John Wick franchise. And I felt the actor that played the young Winston was excellent. The actor that played young Sharon was excellent. In fact, it's just crazy to think that, oh my God, Lance Harrickson passed away earlier this year, right before the fourth movie came out. And now we get to see the beginnings of this character that he played. Crazy ass, racist ass Mel Gibson, he fit just right in with this world. I'll say the negatives I do have for this show is that it's just three long ass parts, especially that third one, like that third one might as well be the length of a feature length movie. I just felt like if they just made this like a normal show in which is like, what, six or ten episodes, I felt like the show would have flowed better. And there was just too many characters. Like, what I like about the John Wick movie is it's all about one person. And, and, and even though there are more characters, but they're all there to serve John Wick as the character and the journey that it goes on throughout those movies. Whereas here, it's almost the same thing, but at the same time, it's like, yes, you give it three long parts to give these characters the time that they need, but in doing so, you also kind of slow down the vibe of the show and the pacing of the show. 
But overall, I did enjoy this, and I can't wait to see what they do with the John Wick franchise next. I'm going to give the Continental a thumbs up emoji. So in between watching the Continental for three weeks, I finally decided to give Twisted Metal a shot before my Peacock subscription ends for the month. But Twisted Metal, it's based on the beloved video games that were for PlayStation. And we follow John Doe and Quiet as they go on this quest to deliver something to New San Francisco. But along the way, they run into some trouble and, and vehicular warfare also follows them and we have our show. Now, I've always heard about the Twisted Metal games, but I've never actually played them. And even if I did, it was only for a brief time. Like, I do have Twisted Metal 3 for the original PlayStation. And the only reason I had this was because back in the day, I went to Five Below when Five Below stores were really starting to pop up. And they sold like old video games and old VHSs and what have you. And this was one of them. So I bought it and played on the PlayStation, had a little fun, but never just really got around to it, mainly because at that point I had an Xbox and why well, am I about to go back to playing the PlayStation 1 for no reason. But the Twisted Metal games do have some history behind them. They are very popular. The last one being the Twisted Metal reboot that came out back in 2012, I believe. But there has not been a new Twisted Metal game ever since. And now we have this new show that is somewhat or loosely based on the video games. And when I heard about the show, I was intrigued, especially because this seems to be the year where Hollywood finally cracked the code on how to make a good video game adaptation. The Last of Us being one of them, the Mario Brothers movie, despite me not being too crazy about it, it made a lot of money and it was admittedly fun. I have not seen Gran Turismo yet. Don't worry, I'm gonna get to it. And with Twisted Metal, I was curious because there's really not that much story to it. It's just people getting into these cars and fighting each other and vehicular warfare. And how I felt about the show, I actually really enjoyed it. Like once the, once the show really started to pick up, which was I believe after episode two, I, I did not want to stop. I wanted to watch more, but I had other things to do and I just could not wait to finish off this season. But this show had a lot of heart that I really did not expect. This, this show really did good on the character work on this show, especially for characters from a video game that really didn't have much backstory to them, but I think they found a way to make the show interesting while also staying true to the original game. And it really was like this first season was getting to know the characters. And then by the end of the season, spoiler alert, they teased the tournament, which is in the game. So, so that's pretty much going to be the basis for season two. And seriously, as far as the character work goes, was James Gunn working on this? Because I swear the humor and the characters, their interactions and the way they act were written by James Gunn. I mean, they weren't, but that's just what it feels like. But again, I just like the vibe of the show. It was funny when it needed to be funny. It was like a post-apocalyptic comedic show. And like I said, John Doe and Quiet are the heart of the show. John Doe, he's played by Anthony Mackie. And Quiet, played by Stephanie Beatrice. They form an unlikely friendship and then they eventually start falling for each other. But what I was also surprised about, the amount of chemistry these two actors have. Because I'll admit, just watching these two together in the choice. I was like, hmm, I don't know, that's an odd pairing. But then the show made you believe that they came together in a believable way. Because at the end of the day, they're both just two fucked up individuals living in a post-apocalyptic world and they go on this journey to get to one place. And like I said, they both have their own baggage. Anthony Mackie has attachment issues, especially to this car that he's been driving around since he was a little kid and the apocalypse happened. Like John Doe, he loves this car the same way Tom Hanks loves the Wilson soccer ball in Castaway. It's this thing that's basically keeping him sane in this insane world that he's living in to the point where he's just talking to it. And Quiet, she doesn't really understand that until the end of the season. But Quiet, she's fucked up too because she has the world on her shoulders because she feels responsible for the death of her loved ones. And she's got to learn to trust people. Sweet Tooth is another original character from the video games. He's just this chubby clown. And he's played by two different people. The physical aspect of it is played by Samoa Joe. But the voice is Will Arnett. And not since Darth Vader has two people brought a character to life so immaculately. He was definitely one of my favorite characters. Niv Campbell plays... I guess let's just say the head of New San Francisco. She basically bribes John Doe into doing her bidding. And Neff Campbell plays her excellently. Like she's convincingly nice when she wants to be nice. But then but then behind closed doors, she has her own plans. And, and you believe her for that. And plus, it's nice to see that Neff Campbell can still get worth after she was lowballed 
for the Scream franchise. Seriously, to this day, I will never understand how you can lowball someone that has literally put a franchise on her back for four and a half movies. Thomas Hayden Church plays Agent Stone, which is another character from the games, and, and he is always good in whatever you put him in. The finale is when they have this big battle between all the different factions, and that's the part of the show that reminded me of the games. If you have not watched Twisted Metal, I highly recommend it. If you're a fan of the Twisted Metal games, you will enjoy this. And even if you've never played the Twisted Metal games, I still recommend it. Just for the character work alone, you will get hooked and you will enjoy this show. I'm going to give Twisted Metal the hard eyes emoji. <laughs> American Horror Story Delicate just wrapped up its first part of this season. And here we follow Anna, played by Emma Roberts. She is an actress that's about to get a lot of awards for this movie she did, but she also wants to get pregnant. And sure enough, she gets pregnant, but then turns out there's a whole bunch of other weird and supernatural stuff that's affecting her behavior and could possibly affect her pregnancy. Now, real quick, I have not watched American Horror Story since the first season murder house and really i didn't catch on to the american horror story series until 2017 because my girlfriend at the time she put me onto the show and i like murder house but for some reason i just never went back and watched any more of the other anthology seasons but after watching this i am just a little bit more compelled to go back and watch some more but i will say the reason why now i'm just now coming back to it is mainly because of kim kardashian I really felt after Tyler Perry's Temptation, I felt that movie convinced all of Hollywood to never put Kim Kardashian in a movie ever again because she was just horrible in that movie. But here, I'll get more into that later. But as for this season as a whole, as far as the five episodes we've gotten so far, because, because in case you don't know, this show was in the middle of shooting when all the strikes started happening. And then once the after strike kicked in, that's when production on the show was put on hold. And who knows when we're going to get part two of this show. But for right now, I'll just give you my general thoughts on American Horror Story Delicate and how I feel about the show going forward. And I actually am digging this show. In fact, Emma Roberts, she's been in, I know she's been in a whole bunch of American Horror Story anthologies. And she's worked with Ryan Murphy before, who is the creator of the show. She worked with him on Scream Queens. And plus Emma Roberts, she's just good at playing just this fragile actress that's just on edge and is ready to freak out. And she wants better for herself. But then all this weird stuff started happening and she's trying to convince everybody, but they don't believe her. She thinks she's crazy. Matt Soonchi, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, but he plays her husband. He's a little bit on edge because of all her antics and foolishness. Now, Kim Kardashian, this is probably the best acting I've seen from her in anything, for real. Now, granted, it's probably because she's essentially playing herself. And I think that's because right now she's working with people that's actually directing her to act. Whereas when she worked with Tyler Perry, and, and again, I respect Tyler Perry, but I feel like he didn't really give her much direction. And she was she felt like she was just in there just reading off lines. But here, it felt like she was being actually directed. It felt like she was herself. And she's actually charming and charismatic at times. And at times, cruel, which, A, is not too far-fetched for her. But I like the horror vibes of this show because we have these raven witches that's just looming over Emma Roberts' character. We don't know what's about to happen, but it's something pertaining to her unborn child. And the show does a good job of building off of that tension. And that's it for my general thoughts on this show, because I don't know how the rest of the show is going to play out until we get the rest of the episodes. And again, Lord knows when we're going to get the rest of it with all these strikes going on. But for right now, I'm going to give American Horror Story Delicate the thumbs up emoji. Abbott Elementary is about this group of teachers and staff at this elementary school and we followed the lives as teachers, staff, and their antics outside of the school at times. Now, I'll admit, it took me a while to catch on to the show because one, it kind of reminded me of The Office and I'm just not a huge fan of The Office because of its dry humor and I'm kind of hit or miss with its mockumentary style, but here it worked. But after watching both seasons, I love this show. It's one of my favorite sitcoms of all time. And also it's just a bit more relatable because I work in the school system. The writing is on point. It's hilarious and brilliant. And plus you just have one of 
probably one of the most solid casts that just works that I have not seen since shows by Community. Like you have Quinta Bronson who plays Janine and she is also the creator of the show. It's dedicated and based off of one of her favorite teachers growing up. But Janine, she is essentially the punching bag of the show, which is a little bit fresh to me. She means well. Anytime you see her fail, I just feel good because it's like, she. I, I like that she's optimistic, but at the same time, she just does some of the most annoying things and, and you're just like, just stop being so optimistic. And she also just sticks her nose in places where it doesn't belong. Like the episode where she's getting cooking lessons from Miss Shemitty and she tries to mend things between her and her sister. Shirley Ralph plays Barbara Howard and she is one of the best characters on the show. She reminds me of someone I knew in school or maybe someone's auntie, grandma, whoever. She is on point with this role. And quick side note, I'm happy this show got a lot of awards such as Quinta Bronson and Shirley Ralph. And I'm telling you, watching Shirley Ralph react to hearing her name being called for best supporting actor in a sitcom was one of the most purest things I have ever seen. But I like her dynamic on the show and the role she plays on the show. She's just the seasoned teacher that has seen it all. And so when Janine comes in with her little optimistic vibes and everything and Miss Howard and even Miss Shemitty, they're all just like, yeah, we've done this before. We all know how this is gonna work out. Like basically, I just like how Miss Howard and Miss Shemitty are just nonchalant to all the bullshit that comes with being a teacher. Plus, Miss Howard has some of the best gags on the show, such as her mistaking white actors with black actors. And the way they pay that off in the season two finale, it is hilarious. And I like her dynamic with Miss Shemitty because again, they're the two veteran teachers. Miss Shemitty, played by Lisa Ann Walter, she is hilarious. Tyler James Williams plays Gregory, and he is not only my favorite character on this show, but he is also the most relatable character on the show because he is just in constant disbelief of the dumb foolishness from his co-workers. And I can definitely relate to that. And his reactions just be on point and on time. He's basically the gym from the office of this show. And I never even watched The Office like that. And I like his dynamic with Janine and the way their romance blossoms over the course of season two. That when they do get together or they entertain the possibility of being together, you just rooting for them. They're the yin to each other's yang. Now, Jacob, look, he's a good dude and I'm sure he means well. And he is funny, but sometimes he got very annoying with trying to relate to anybody that's not the same skin color as him and he also became the Brita of the show with all his SJW crap. Principal Ava Coleman, oh that character gets on my nerves so much. Played by Janelle James so don't get it twisted she was hilarious but also just she just does things that just made me be like why are you a principal? Like, I swear, this is the most inept principle I've ever seen now. And I know that's part of the joke, but at the same time, it still got annoying. And maybe that's just on me because I just don't like blatantly stupid or inept characters. Then you got Mr. Johnson, who is the custodian. And, hey, he's not on the show but as much, but when he's on the show, he definitely does bring the laughs. And plus, let's be real, you got two types of custodians in the school system. They're either cool as hell or they're the biggest snitches in the building. But more importantly, what I love about this show is that it's just relatable and real to anybody that's worked in the school system. Anybody that is a teacher can relate to this show. And if you've not worked in the school system or not a teacher, I implore you to watch this show because it will definitely put a lot of things in perspective for you and in a comedic way. This show effectively shows the economic deficiencies of school funding in areas of color. And it also shows all the BS that teachers have to go through just to get the things that they need that should be provided to them just so they can do their fucking job. Like, there's also that one episode where Janine, she has a parent-teacher conference about one of her students that's acting out. She tries to reason with the parent, but the parent is just not having it and calls her the worst teacher. And Janine, she breaks down and cries. I found that very real because, let's be real, kids, they are products of their parents. And when you have parents like that are just uncompromising, it can get to your self-esteem a little bit. They'll either mess with your self-esteem or it just makes the job a lot harder than it has to be. Abbott Elementary is one of my new favorite sitcoms and I hope to God that these strikes end because I really need this show to come back. This show is like therapy to me. I'm gonna give Abbott Elementary the hands up emoji because this show is a masterpiece. So Best Buy announced that starting in 2024, they are doing away with their Blu-ray and DVD section and that they're not just doing it in stores but online as well, which stores I can understand, but online I'm like, Really? Why? 
I mean, they gotta have some place where they can buy Blu-rays and DVDs, if not available in the stores, whenever they do make them. But regardless, this is a day that we all saw coming and it is sad, but we all knew it was gonna happen at one point or another. But of course, it's particularly sad for me for a number of reasons. Why? Because as you can see behind me, I like collecting physical media. Hell, here's even a picture of all the Blu-rays that I bought for movies that came out this year. Transformers Rise of the Beast being the latest one that I purchased given how it came out on Blu-ray just last week. But the reason Best Buy is doing this because of declined sales within Blu-rays and DVDs and the rise of streaming, which I do get. But for a long time, Best Buy was my place to go to buy Blu-rays and DVDs. But the one specific reason I always like going to Best Buy for Blu-rays is just to get maybe a specific movie on Steelbook. Yeah, there's these Steelbooks that they used to sell in Best Buy. It had some really cool cover art. Like one of my favorite Steelbooks that I got out of Best Buy was of Captain America Civil War. As you can see, like this is probably one of my favorite Steelbooks right here just for the art alone. And what's crazy is I really didn't start buying the Steelbooks for MCU movies until after Avengers Age of Ultron came out. I thought that looked very good and then but I didn't buy Ant-Man on Steelbook, but then starting in Phase 3, I swear to you not. From that point on, I just started buying every single MCU movie on Steelbook. Like, I have every Phase 3 MCU movie on Steelbook, except for Spider-Man Homecoming and Far From Home. And even then, I still bought Steelbooks for Phase 4 movies, Fact Eternals. I think this was probably the last, not only the last MCU movie that I bought on Steelbook, but the last Steelbook I bought, period, at least from my memory. Because at some point, I... I just couldn't keep spending all that money on steelbooks. Like $35 plus, I couldn't afford to keep spending money on steelbooks because they are hella expensive. But another favorite steelbook of mine is Straight Outta Compton. I don't know why, it just this just looks awesome to me. But this didn't just start with Best Buy. Like, physical media has just kind of been dying down over the past couple of years. Like, over the past couple of years, every time I went into Best Buy, that Blu-ray and DVD section just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller it just looked very scarce and depressing to me and now it's the first sign i knew like okay yep it's the beginning of the end right here now if i were to play devil's advocate there are benefits to physical media going away because one for space and hey you don't have to spend a lot of money just buying physical media or go to the store to get a blu-ray dvd it's right there it's already on a streaming service or if you, even if you still want a copy of the movie you can buy it on itunes or what have you but the disadvantages to physical media going away is because most of the time movies and tv can be found on a streaming service and somebody might pull a david zasloff and pull it from that streaming service and they didn't make a blu-ray dvd for it so it's just gone there is no evidence of it and even if they bought it back they might bring back a different version of it so it's like you don't even have the original copy of it anyway I can imagine by the end of this decade, physical media is just gone completely. No more Blu-rays, no more DVDs. And even if they do make a resurgence, they're going to make a resurgence the way vinyl records have made a resurgence. Like Blu-rays and DVDs, they're just going to be this collector's item that you will rarely find and they'll only make but so many copies of it. But in conclusion, like, A, I'm low-key happy that physical media is kind of going away because as long as, long as I keep buying Blu-rays and DVDs, it's either going to destroy me financially or it could make me happy. And if this is going to force me to make better financial decisions, then A, so be it. It's just sad for crazy people like me that actually like collecting movies.